Thanks to 80,000 Hours for supporting this SciShow video. 80,000 Hours is a nonprofit that aims to help people have a positive impact with their career. You can start planning a career that helps solve the most pressing problems in the world at 80,000hours.org slash SciShow. So you may have heard lots of hullabaloo lately about humans going back to the moon. And there are a bunch of reasons to head up there again, from scratching humanity's itch to explore the unknown, to more practical things like mining. But from the surface of our dynamic and ever-changing planet, it might seem like those journeys will be a little bit boring. It's easy to dismiss the moon as a lifeless frozen rock. Because we can't currently go inside the moon to check on how geologically active it is, we have to rely on clues from its surface to tell us what's going on. And some of those clues tell us that the moon could very much be alive. Before we talk about the moon's reputation for being geologically dead, we need to talk about how it was born. We think the moon formed about four and a half billion years ago, back when the young Earth hadn't quite grown to its full size. Our proto-Earth and a Mars-sized planet called Theia had a bit of an altercation. They smashed right into one another, and most of their guts ended up merging together. But this galactic car crash also threw tons of material into space, which eventually coalesced to form our moon. The baby moon would have loomed large in Earth's sky. Their mutual gravitational tugging may have caused massive tides of lava to spill over the surface. The moon would have glowed red hot from the surface down into the core, and it's been slowly cooling down ever since. But cooling isn't the same as frozen. And if there are still some liquidy bits churning around beneath the surface, we might see signs on the surface as recently solidified lava. When we look at the moon, we see a bunch of gray splotches called maria, which is Latin for seas. They're darker in color from the rest of the surface because they're made of a different kind of rock, called basalt. That's a type of frozen lava, so planetary scientists are pretty sure maria are evidence that the moon was once geologically active. But is it still? And if not, how long ago did that end? Well, it turns out dating the moon can be tricky. And scientists have two main strategies. The first is simply looking at craters. If a smaller crater is on top of another, we know that that crater has to be younger. Otherwise, it would have been destroyed when the larger meteorite hit. We can also look at the number of craters in an area. Generally, the greater the crater count, the older a patch of rock is, because space rocks have had more time to smash themselves into it. These are both forms of relative dating. Craters can't tell us the absolute age of a particular part of the moon, but we can use them to tell how old a feature is compared to another one. And most of the moon's surface appears to be billions of years old. But by counting craters, scientists have identified lava that may be a mere 18 million years old. If the moon were my age, that's like less than two months ago. But to confirm it's actually that young, we'd need to get our hands on actual rock samples to get a precise age. And that's where the second dating method comes in. We can cross-reference crater counts with radiometric dating to get a baseline for age estimates. Radiometric dating looks at the composition of the rocks themselves. Some isotopes, or versions of atoms, are radioactive and break down over time. And they do that breaking down at a very predictable rate. So to estimate how old a given moon rock is, scientists will compare two measurements measurements, how much of the original isotope is left versus how much there is of the stuff it decayed into. Unfortunately, real lunar samples are a little bit hard to come by. You can't exactly just pop up there whenever you like to date whatever part of the moon you want. But the Apollo missions of the 1960s and 70s did bring back hundreds of kilos of rocks. And in 2020, China's Chang'e 5 lander performed its own sample return. The Apollo rock collection is chock full of samples that formed over 4 billion years ago. Meanwhile, Chang'e 5's basalts were dated to be as young as 2 billion years old. So just going by these limited samples, it looks like lunar volcanism went quiet a long time ago, which actually could be good news for future explorers. After all, the moon's surface is dangerous enough without having to worry about new pools of lava erupting from the ground or a volcanic eruption ruining your day. But some features call this into question. Take Ina, for example. It's a small but bright crater in a spot called the Lake of Happy. Ina isn't like other craters. It wasn't caused by an impact. If it were, we would expect to see its floor lower than the surrounding surface. Instead, it looks more like a volcanic feature, and its rock looks more shiny and less worn down than the surrounding material, making it appear super young. Now, we've only photographed Ina from space. No mission has ever landed in it. So one team started counting its craters. And in 2006, they came back with the incredibly young estimate of 2 million years, if not younger. Now, to explain this age, they 
proposed what might seem like a pretty quirky hypothesis. The moon let out a giant burp of subsurface lunar gas. When the gas escaped, the rock collapsed with the sudden lack of support. But it is worth noting that not every astronomer agrees that Ina is this young. There's another gassy hypothesis out there that Ina's rocks were made out of a super foamy lava, kind of like pumice. Their texture could be hiding a lot of craters, making Ina look literally billions of years younger than it really is. Either way, two million years is still a long time for us humans, so Ina might not be enough evidence to say the moon isn't dead now, but we're not done yet. Even if humans have never seen an eruption, we do know that underneath its surface, the moon is rumbling. Lunar scientists have analyzed nearly a decade of moonquake recordings thanks to seismometers left up there by Apollo astronauts. But what could be causing that? There shouldn't be much heat left over from the moon's formation, but radioactive elements deep underground could be releasing enough energy to power tectonic activity. And while the moon doesn't have giant plates of crust sliding around like Earth does, there might be enough of a difference in heat between rocks deeper underground and those near the surface to allow rocks to shift positions. As the rock slowly cools, it becomes denser and sinks, while warm, less dense rock pushes its way up. And the ongoing mutual gravitational tugging between the Earth and the Moon, and even the occasional space rock impact, could add to the total heat budget as well. Collectively, maybe it's warm enough for some liquid magma to be moving around down there. Upcoming missions may be able to learn more. While there probably won't be any explosive Mount St. Helens-style eruptions for our explorers to witness, the Moon still has many secrets beneath its surface. We've only just begun to get a glimpse. And if you're searching for a glimpse at a new job that really makes a difference in the world, you can start with 80,000 Hours. 80,000 Hours is a nonprofit created to help you find a fulfilling job. They aim to help people have a positive impact with their career and really do some good in the world. All of their curated, high-impact career postings are free to access through their job board. But whether you're ready to look at job postings or not, you can always start with their blog posts and podcasts that explore different global problems and the careers that help solve them. Just like the moon, the concept of a rewarding job search isn't as dead as you think. For a free copy of the 80,000 Hours In-Depth Career Guide, click the link in the description down below or go to 80,000hours.org slash scishow. While you're there, you can sign up for their newsletter full of updates on their research and job opportunities. And just to be clear, everything they provide is always free. Their only aim is to help you find a fulfilling, impactful career. Thanks for watching this SciShow video, and thanks to 80,000 Hours for supporting it.